This is Matej from Consensus Lab in Protocol Labs. And uh, today I want to introduce you to MIR, our open source framework for implementing distributed systems. MIR is really implementing distributed systems the easy way. Today, I'll be just talking uh, about it on a high level. I give a short introduction, namely what it is and how it works. But first, let's look at uh, what we are actually dealing with and what the background is. And I, I think it's important to uh, recall what the model is that we're considering when, when implementing distributed systems. So I will very quickly recall what a node is, what a distributed system is for our purposes, what an algorithm and distributed algorithm is, what a distributed abstraction is, and uh, how it is usually implemented. And then I will uh, tell you how MIR comes into play and uh, how it makes it easy to implement these things. All right, so first, just to be on the same page, what is a node? A node is some entity that has some internal state. It can perform computation on that internal state uh, and transform it. And uh, it can also communicate with other nodes uh, using uh, message passing, so through sending and receiving messages. A distributed system is just a collection of nodes that can communicate through some uh, communication network uh again just through sending messages to each other all right so what is a distributed algorithm a distributed algorithm is just a collection of algorithms that these nodes execute very often each node executes exactly the same algorithm as all the other nodes but this is not necessarily always the case so generally it uh, it, it can be different but uh that's not really the, the point now and uh, we just know that a distributed algorithm is a collection of algorithms executed by all the nodes of a distributed system. Now we are going to focus on, on a single node and uh, how, uh, how it is executing its algorithm. And always keep in mind that all the other nodes have their in instances of their algorithms and they're doing the same thing. But we are looking at it now from the point of view of one node. Okay, so what is the algorithm the node executes? Well, in general, an algorithm is just a sequence of steps a machine can execute, at least for the purpose of this video. Uh, in general, it could be something like get input from, get one input from the user, get another input, add those inputs, store them on disk, uh, whatever, while some condition is true, then you do something, and uh, it can send a message afterwards to some IP address, uh, whatever. So this is just a sequence of steps the node executes. Now, in a distributed setting, it is uh, very useful to think about the algorithm from a slightly different point of view or in a slightly different way. We uh, remember that the node the, that the node is part of a of a bigger distributed system and it receives inputs all the time from that system and from the outside world or from the user. So, uh, what is what is very useful is to break this algorithm uh, apart in some abstractions that interact with each other and that represent well the the system we are studying and the model which we are considering so that's why distributed systems are or distributed algorithms are all are very often um, described in terms of distributed abstractions a distributed abstraction is some kind of a black box that consumes events and produces events each node usually has a local instance of such a distributed abstraction and uh, each node can each node feeds events to the abstraction and consumes events uh, that the abstraction produces for example if we have two nodes and uh, they have a link abstraction uh, then the link might consume send message events and uh, might produce message received events and uh, the contract it might provide is that if one node invokes a send message event on the abstraction, on the link abstraction, then eventually the message received event will be triggered by the abstraction uh, at the other node. So each abstraction always has events that it consumes and events that it produces. Mm, slightly more well-known or more common abstraction, well, not necessarily more common, but the abstraction we are very interested in is also the consensus abstraction. It can also be modeled with just two events, propose and decide, 
it consumes a, a propose event and then it promises that it will trigger a decide event at all at all the nodes eventually and the that the value will be the same and so on uh, that's also not really the point now all right so distributed abstractions uh, can be also combined in a in a way that they use each other's events like one abstraction triggers an event that another abstraction uh, consumes and uh, this can go arbitrarily deep so for example if we have a consensus abstraction we can see it as some uh, black box that ex that executes some algorithm that consumes proposed events and triggers decisive decide events but in the inside of the abstraction uh, basically needs to do something uh, meaningful when when it receives the proposed event and it needs to know when to decide when to trigger the decide event and with what value so the implementation of an abstraction in general just needs to dictate what how to react to a proposed event and when to uh, when to trigger the uh, decide event and uh, the reactions to events can also be triggering more events for example in this case when when a proposed uh, event occurs at the at the consensus abstraction it might trigger one send message event to tell the other node what the proposed value is uh, and it can uh, trigger another event setting some timeout in case the other node doesn't respond and then it knows what what needs to happen when a timeout is triggered and when the message is received for example when a message is received it changes some internal state if the if the other node let's say agrees with the value it can trigger the decide event and uh, then in this state will uh, ignore the timeout event if it occurs for example so uh, the bottom line is that the implementation of the abstraction the the algorithm that it executes basically just describes reactions to events that come from the outside and conditions under which new events are triggered so if this is how it's very typically expressed in pseudocode uh, the implementation of an abstraction very often called distributed algorithm which is nothing more than in, than an implementation of such an abstraction uh, is expressed in uh, little blocks that uh, describe what has to happen inside the abstraction when different events occur for example uh, an abstraction uh, implementation could react to an init event to a message received event and to a timeout event by respectively setting some counters to zero and triggering some ready event when in, when initialized it could uh, when it receives a message it can check whether the message is uh, correct or consistent with its state it could update the local state uh, accordingly and uh, trigger maybe some other message events depends depending on what the message was uh, and for example on a timeout event coming from some timer it could just say it could just trigger abort uh, which would maybe be consumed by some other abstraction again so all these all these red uh mark things are actually events so we are consuming events here in the upon lines and we are producing events in the trigger lines and this is really the way the distributed algorithms are most commonly specified all right so now now we now we have uh, the distributed algorithm mindset and let's look at how mir comes into the game so mir is a tool for expressing these distributed algorithms in the go language it is uh it is a public open source project uh, that you can find on github the slides uh, will be published along this video and uh with, with a clickable link on it on them and uh, mir is basically a, a framework it's a library that implements a framework such that a process that is using the library runs on each node of the distributed system and uh, the mir library executes the local steps of the specified algorithm so basically the the programmer who wants to implement 
a distributed algorithm, can instantiate MIR, can define within the MIR framework this algorithm that uh, they want to exec be executed, and MIR will just execute that. So how does it work in practice? First, let's look at how we model these abstractions. MIR uh, provides the abstraction of a module, which is exactly uh, which is exactly one to one depiction of the abstraction of, uh, in a distributed system. It is it is some some entity, some some uh, some black box actually from outside uh, that just consumes events and produces events. We need to know nothing else about it. And of course, it executes some algorithm that the programmer can specify. Mm. So to be more concrete, uh, imagine we have uh, we have uh, the pseudocode from before. We have the init event and the message received event. Then in MIR, the implementation would uh, look like the code on the right. We have uh, for each event that we need to react to, we write the function, apply that event, like apply init or apply message received. And the body of the function just specified what needs to happen when the event is triggered. And uh, here we see we can just set some internal counter to uh, to zero on the init event, uh, on the internal state of the module. So the module is basically a Go struct. It's a, it's an object that that can have uh, properties that store its state, and uh, this can be modified through the event handlers. Uh, the events triggered by uh, the, by the abstraction or by the implementation they are uh, they are returned from the corresponding handler functions so whatever the handler function returns is a is is an event that is considered to be triggered by that by that module we see that the in the function signature that all these event handlers they return apart from an error uh, a list of events because they might trigger more than one event and uh, when the computation is done we return a list of events in this case only one event namely the ready event uh, that uh, will consider to be triggered and mir will uh, will route this event to the appropriate module for the message received it's the analogous thing all right so here i was talking about uh, what we call a passive module in mir which really just uh, transforms input events into output events and possibly uh, updating the internal state. But it doesn't really do anything on its own where, without being triggered from the outside by some event. So it never creates events out of the blue. The passive module couldn't uh, just uh, tell the system, hey, a message has been received because uh, it needs to create this message received event in the first place. Uh, so this is uh, good for, for example, the protocol logic, where we only really need to specify some state and some transformations on the state and uh, and so on. Now, to communicate with the outside world, like for sending and receiving, uh, sorry, for receiving messages or for receiving timeouts from the operating system, we uh, provide what is the so-called active module, that can produce events even without being triggered. Technically, it is uh, solved uh, slightly differently. In Go, it actually exposes a channel. And uh, whenever there's something of interest, it just writes that event to the channel. And then uh, the mirror framework reads that channel and, uh, and uh, routes these events to the appropriate places. Uh, you can have a look at the details of this in the documentation, which is also linked here. So if you download the slides or if you look at the slides, you can click on that and have a closer look. All right, so now we have the we have the modules and we know how to how to describe an algorithm that needs to be executed. And really, as you see, it's very close to the to the protocol uh, as described in the pseudocode. There is some more boilerplate code uh, when we are instantiating these events and defining uh, the modules and in their state, but the vast majority of it is uh, actually generated by the tools that come with the MIR framework. All right, so we have the modules. So what do we do with them? We need to somehow have the whole thing run. Mm. So the main abstraction provided by the MIR library is the MIR node. 
A node represents a node in a distributed system, and it's basically a collection of modules that orchestrates those modules and uh, routes events between the modules. So, for example, if we have the example from before, we have some consensus module, some link module, and some time run module. The consensus module uh, has a has a apply propose method. That apply propose method would return two events, namely set timeout and send message event, and then the mirror node implementation would take these events, uh, look up the timer and the link event, and call the appropriate functions on those. How does it work in practice? In practice, the main uh, function of some, of some program that the programmer writes at some point will contain the mirror.new node call, and uh, the mirror new node just creates a new instance of a, of a distributed systems node. Of distributed system node. Uh, so let's go through the arguments first. In a, and this is again just an example. So when we instantiate a node, we just need to tell it a bunch of stuff. We tell it uh, its own ID. Uh, we tell it some configuration configuration parameters like uh, where it should write the logging output and so on. And the most important part is which modules it should use. Each module has a name. In this case, it's the string on the left, it's the app, the protocol, the net, or the crypto module. And uh, on the right, we uh, are actually variables that uh, we need to have populated with instances of the corresponding modules. So for example, we can have a user application module that, uh, that uh, prints output to the user. We can have a protocol logic that just decides what, uh, how to react to messages and uh, what to, what state to keep at, at, on the protocol level. The network transport module is one that actually takes care of establishing network connections and uh, and sending and receiving messages. That that's it need to be it needs to be an active module. And uh, we can have a crypto also as a separate module uh, when we want to have a modular implementation of uh, cryptographic operations. For example, uh, when the protocol module needs to sign something, it would emit a signature request event that the crypto module consumes. The crypto module will uh, compute the signature and uh, trigger an event that the signature has been computed and the protocol can continue its operation. Another advantage of this is that each of these modules is executed, the logic of each of these modules is executed in a separate Go routine and uh, we can parallelize a lot and while keeping the logic of each module sequential making it much easier to reason about there are two more two more uh parameters that i haven't mentioned yet it's a write ahead log and an interceptor a write ahead log it's uh, both of them are optional if we use nil they're just not used write ahead log is just a persistent write ahead log that can be attached to a node such that important events can be actually persisted to disk on the and this would help the node recover from crashes and the interceptor is also a very useful component that uh, is a uh, that can be used for debugging so actually what we have is that the node that looks like here on the picture um, it has several modules that produce events they're stored in an in internal event buffer and the dispatcher dispatches these uh, these events to the appropriate modules again. Now, when the before the events are being dispatched, we can actually intercept them with the interceptor and store them somewhere outside of the node. And later we can inspect them with a debugger, or we can even uh, instantiate a new instance of the node and inject those events one by one to have a very close look at what's happening. The node also has two more functions, run and stop, with the obvious meanings. Uh, after instantiation, we need to call run on the node such that all this machinery starts moving, that uh, we spawn the thread that is distributing the events and collecting them from the modules and so on. And at the end, we just call stop, which stops everything. All right, so this was the very first introduction to the MIR system. Please go check it out at GitHub. And uh, the next time, uh, we'll be building a sample application from scratch using the mere framework so this will be actually a coding video 
well, where I'll start from scratch and step-by-step uh, -step create a sample application so you can see how actually mm, this, uh, how this works and how we can use it as well. Thank you very much for watching.